Okay. Um, this is too exciting a topic and too big an audience not to get underway. Um, we advertised this in a somewhat uh, uh, provocative way, uh, asking whether people like Edward Snowden and Private Manning um, are whistleblowers, patriots, or traitors. Um, there's an implicit uh, second question, one of many, is what is the proper ethical, moral uh, relationship between them and journalists? So I'm not, my job is to, to introduce Sandy Toland, a uh, professor here at the uh, School of Journalism, who uh, has brought this road show uh, to Annenberg and USC. So, Sandy? Thank you, Michael Parks. Uh, and thanks to you and Larry Gross and many other here at, at Annenberg who have made this possible. Um, too numerous to mention, but also to our colleagues from the Government Accountability Project, uh, including those that are in Washington, Dana Gold, Allison Glick, and many others for making this possible. This is a collaboration between Annenberg and the Government Accountability Project, and uh, I know that my, my colleagues here on the panel can uh, tell you a little bit more about GAP, but this is, I believe, the eighth on a series of whistleblower events on the whistleblower college tour that, that GAP is co-sponsoring with other universities. So um, I thought um, before getting into uh, the specifics and asking the panelists uh, to talk about the, the issues, especially with, related to government surveillance in the press. Um, I wanted to first introduce them and then give a little bit of context for those of you who haven't been following it closely or just maybe need to be reminded of the scope of the revelations and the scope, especially of the amount of, of uh, surveillance uh, that, was, uh, come, that has come to light through the revelations of Edward Snowden, uh, and especially regarding the National Security Agency. But first of all, I want to introduce uh, my co-panelists. Jessalyn Raddick, sitting right here, is the National Security and Human Rights Director of GAP. Um, she is a former ethics advisor to the U.S. Department of Justice. Um, she came to be known to many more people um, as a whistleblower after she disclosed that the FBI committed what she believed to be an ethics violation in their interrogation of John Walker Lynn, the so-called American Taliban, captured during the 2001 investig uh, invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, without an attorney president, and alleged that the DOJ was attempting to suppress that information. Uh, the Lynn case was the first major terrorism prosecution after 9-11, and the story, that story is told in her memoir, Traitor, the Whistleblower, and the American Taliban. Um, as an attorney, she's also represented Edward Snowden, uh, as well as Thomas Drake, who is sitting right to her right, each of whom was charged under the Espionage Act. Um, speaking of Thomas Drake, uh, Thomas is a 10-year veteran of the Air Force specializing in intelligence. He served as a CIA analyst and a contractor for the NSA for 12 years before joining the agency full-time in 2001. While at the NSA, Drake witnessed what he saw as mass waste and abuse in the billions of dollars spent on Operation Stellar Wind. He took his concerns to his superiors at the NSA. Um, later, after he disclosed unclassified information and finding uh, no relief within the agency, he disclosed unclassified information to a Baltimore Sun reporter. Uh, the federal government initiated a criminal prosecution under the Espionage Act of 1917. He faced five charges. Uh, later, the charges were dropped. This is the fourth case in U.S. history where the government uh, used the act to go after someone for allegedly mishandling classified materials. Pentagon Papers whistleblower Daniel Ellsberg was the first. Uh, Richard Reeves, to my left, is my colleague here at Annenberg, is a professor here at the school. The author and syndicated, syndicated columnist whose column has appeared in more than 100 newspapers since 1979. He's been a correspondent for the New York Herald Tribune, chief correspondent for the New York Times, national editor of Esquire, chief correspondent for PBS Frontline, and is the author of more than a dozen books, including books on President Reagan and Kennedy and President Nixon. And then relevantly to this uh, event, he's the author of What the People Know, Freedom of, and the Press, uh, that was published by Harvard University in 1998. So our format, I'm just going to give a little bit of context. 
uh, for today's uh, discussion and try to do that relatively quickly so that each, uh, and then Richard is going to provide some historical context going back to the days of COINTELPRO. Uh, most of you probably in the room have not heard that word, or many of you haven't. Um, and uh, the, the uh, Pentagon Papers case with Daniel Ellsberg. Um, but I want to start out just laying a little, uh, and then we'll get to, to Jess and Tom and, and talk about uh, their uh, impressions of, of the press implications for press freedoms. And then we want to spend uh, plenty of time uh, opening up to questions as well. Uh, James Bamford, who is a famous, uh, uh, who famously has written about uh, the NSA for many years, including a, the classic book Puzzle Palace, wrote not too long ago in Time Magazine, at the same time that the world is getting smaller through digitization and social media, the intelligence agencies are getting larger and more technologically sophisticated. The same watchful satellites that pass over Iran twice a day also pass over the U.S. And the same fiber optic cables the NSA taps to eavesdrop uh, upon foreign communications also contain domestic calls. How much access should be allowed and who watches the watchers? Well, that's a good question, and one of those watchers of the watchers, of course, was Edward Snowden. And you, guess, you could say that he still is Edward Snowden. I mean, he's still watching the watchers from his trove of documents. Just to give you a little sense of what he exposed and what we've come to know largely through his revelations, um, the NSA, uh, according to, in the, in the words of the New York Times, called the, uh, the NSA an electronic omnivore of staggering capabilities, eavesdropping and hacking its way around the world to strip governments and other targets of their secrets. Access to email and searches through Google and Yahoo. We've also learned that Skype selected, started a secret program to make calls accessible to intelligence agencies, tapping into American social connections to data mine their movements, friends, traveling companions, habit, habits, digitally stripping citizens bare, again in the words of uh, Bamford. By 2011, 1.8 billion phone records per day, gearing up to 20 billion, available for analysis within 60 minutes. Uh, from The Guardian, files show a vast scale of current NSA metadata programs with one stream, one stream alone uh, collecting one trillion records processed. Uh, in addition, spying on friendly governments, Laura Poitras, one of the people who is come out along, of course, with, uh, with Glenn Greenwald and Barton Gelman of the Washington Post uh, with many of these revelations. The documentary filmmaker, in an article in the German Daily Der Spiegel, documents uh, American intelligence service monitors around half a billion telephone calls, emails, and text messages a day in the country every month. Millions of text messages per day. Uh, on March 18th, a major new story in the Washington Post broke revealing the NSA collects the contents of metadata from every phone call in specific target countries and stores them for 30 days at a time, including calls from U.S. citizens who live, visit, or phone others abroad. At the request of the U.S. officials, the Post declined to name the countries targeted by the program. This is from a very interesting timeline, by the way, in Al Jazeera, America, this last thing I read to you. Uh, later, we learned of the tapping of foreign leaders' cell phones. I think you all remember that story, including Angela Merkel of Germany and Dima Rousseff of Brazil, and 33 other world leaders and the Vatican. Um, also, there was sort of a, uh, something kind of reminiscent of the old COINTEL program, attempts to embarrass certain mo Muslim figures in internet uh, on their alleged internet porn habits, considering to try to discredit them uh, right out of COINTELPRO. NBC recently uh, uh, got a hold of documents that again came to light under uh, Snowden. Um, the agency, uh, the, the NSC cyber spy conferences Goal, goal of the NSA was to destroy, deny, degrade, and disrupt enemies by discrediting them, planting misinformation, and shutting down their communications. Okay, so that gives you a little sense. That's just from uh, that's something you could find out by just going through various sources, including this timeline. Um, so, what does this mean for press freedoms? Just to, to say a couple of things before turning it over to Richard. Um, the Associated Press. Uh, you probably remember last year it came to light that in 2012 uh, the NSA or the, the Justice Department had se secretly obtained two months of reporter and editor phone records. The AP president and chief executive officer 
said there can be no possible justification for this, but it was defended by the Obama administration and Attorney General Eric Holder. Uh, the AP reported that the Department of Justice obtained lists of incoming and outgoing calls and the duration of each call, the work and personal phone numbers of individual reporters, general AP office numbers in New York, Washington, et cetera, et cetera. Department of Justice lawyers argued later that New York Times reporter James Ryzen should be forced to testify in the trial of a former CIA agent, Jeffrey Sterling, who is charged with leaking classified information to Ryzen. From Salon.com, the story of, um, and many other places, the story of the Attorney General Holder personally signed off on the warrant naming Fox News journalist James Rosen as a possible co-conspirator in violation of the Espionage Act. Invoking the Espionage Act, as the administration has repeatedly done, it's an investigation was designed as a law, uh, it, it, was, it was actually invoking a law that was designed uh, to give President Wilson uh, carte blanche to lock up people opposed to the U.S. entering World War I, uh, entering the U.S. around the time of World War I. And finally, uh, from Steve, a Steve Call piece in The New Yorker last year in the fall, um, he points out that, um, that the argument that Holder uh, uh, made uh, in, in going after the leaker who gave information to James Risen, basically rejected any mo notion of a reporter's constitutional pri privilege to protect sources in a criminal proceeding. Um, and uh, this basically eliminates the notion uh, that the reporter's work serves the public interest. Of course, those of us who are in a journalism school would argue that this work does, in fact, serve the public interest, and we're here to discuss that. Um, uh, finally, um, I just want to, I think, with that, um, point out one more fact, which is under the Obama administration, Attorney General Holder has approved more media leak prosecutions than all per previous attorneys general combined. All previous attorneys general combined. Um, with that, a lot of people are reminded of the days of the Pentagon Papers, the days of COINTELPRO, and, and my colleague, uh, Richard Reeves, who's been there through uh, so much of this, is going to give us a little historical context. Thanks. Uh, I'll start with uh, Woodrow Wilson and <laughs> uh, The United States, unlike other countries, particularly Britain, has no tradition of resignation and protest when an official decides that he or she can no longer support uh, what the, the government is doing or their agency. And in fact, the most famous uh, resignation in protest in our history is probably William Jennings Bryan, who was Secretary of State in 1915 and quit publicly after the sinking of the Lusitania because he was a pacifist and he was persuaded that Woodrow Wilson was planning to, to go to war. Bryan had been the most popular speaker in the country. When he did this, he went back on the, the circuit and would be booed down or had tomatoes, etc., thrown at him because Americans, in a way, are an odd people. We're a nation that celebrates uh, our individualism, but we're supposed to be team players uh, at the same time. I, I'm going to focus on the people I know who did this, uh, who I've written about or spent time with over the years. Uh, and I will say that they have all been, in my experience, obsessive folk, uh, people who thought they could save the world, uh, and people who would not lie when put to the test. Uh, they were either a little crazy or a lot crazy, and if they weren't, they became that way after the government and the system uh, went out to crush them. Uh, and with, uh, with things far worse than uh, the Internet. Uh, the system retaliates, and it retaliates big time. Uh, I want to talk about a man named Ernest Fitzgerald, who was 42 years old in 1968 uh, and was a systems analyst in the, uh, in the Air Force. Uh, almost like many whistleblowers, uh, it almost happened to him by accident. There were, the Washington Post had been reporting cost overruns on a transport, new Air Force transport, the C-130, uh, 
C5A in the $2 billion range. Uh, a number of people were called to appear before Congress. They all said they didn't know anything about it. When Ernie Fitzgerald was called, uh, he was finally uh, asked by the chairman of the committee, William Proxmire, Senator William Proxmire, whether the press reports of the overruns were true. Even then, Fitzgerald tried to fudge it a bit, and his answer uh, was, uh, well, your figure could be approximately right. <laughs> that was the end of uh, his career. Uh, he, uh, he was fired uh, by the Air Force. He was making $31,000 a year, which in those days was pretty good money, and apparently, not apparently, he was a very competent uh, fellow, and uh, he was fired on the grounds that he was not a civil servant, that he had, that the Air Force computers had made an error, and in fact he wasn't. It was the only error of that kind uh, ever made, that about whether uh, someone was in uh, civil service. Years later, he five years for five years he made less than twenty thousand dollars a year. No one would hire him. His expertise, which was in defense, uh, obviously defense contractors uh, and the Air Force and the other military services, are pretty close. And he was a man left out there alone. Five years in, uh, the courts ruled that his firing was illegal and he was restored to his job, uh, but given no work. Uh, sat alone in an office in the Pentagon with his $800,000 in legal bills. Uh, when he and I would walk the halls of the, uh, it was amazing, uh, of the Pentagon, uh, people, he knew everybody there. He was a big country boy from, uh, from Alabama, very gregarious, very friendly. And as we walked in the halls, if someone came out a door or someone was walking, they would turn to the wall and walk by. These were people he had known for, for 20 years. Uh, and so that one of the things I learned was that the Amish know what they're doing with shunning. The Soviets knew what they were doing with non personing uh, It is a cruel, cruel punishment. It's a high price, and in the studying whistleblowers, it's a history of mental illness in their families, suicides of their children, because they are being crushed day by day. Uh, I will, uh, and I'll use Fitzgerald as that example. Now, the Fitzgerald case became famous enough that it reached the President of the United States, uh, Richard Nixon. And this was what the, uh, in 1970, uh, the memo to, uh, to President Nixon said, Fitzgerald is no doubt a top-notch cost expert, but he must be given low marks in loyalty. Only a basic no-goodnik would take his grievances so far from normal channels. We should let him bleed. Uh, that memo was written by a former Air Force officer general uh, whose moment of truth came four years later. Alex, Alexander Butterfield wrote that memo to, uh, to President Nixon. Uh, so the bottom line is I think they are strange, brave people. I admire them. They're necessary. Uh, and the reason they're necessary, I would say, is that the person who jumps up at great risk, maybe more, maybe more than they know uh, when they do, and shots that the emperor has no clothes, gives each one of us a little more freedom than we had before. Because the system, the government, the corporations uh, are have to take into account that one of us might be the next whistleblower. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Let me turn to our <laughs> other <laughs> panelists, Jessalyn. Radek, could you talk a little bit about, especially given what Richard said in terms of the historical context, what do you see as the major implications for, for press freedoms right now, given the context of all of the revelations, especially starting with Snowden, who is one of, you're one of his attorneys? 
I think there are huge implications um, for press freedoms. I've always said that the war on whistleblowers that has been going on since 2010, when Tom Drake got indicted, is really a backdoor war on journalists. Because in every single indictment, journalist names appear thinly disguised. For example, journalist A, who wrote an article for the New York Times on January 19th about X, Y, and Z. So clearly you know who journalists A, B, and C are. Um, and while the government has um, always said, don't worry, we're never going to actually call a journalist, um, Jim Risen of the New York Times has been subpoenaed three times, twice under Bush and once under Obama, and is currently under subpoena to testify against a whistleblower. In another espionage case, a man um, named Jeff Sterling, who revealed that uh, this Merlin operation um, was had a design defect, and actually, in, in giving this program to Iran, I think we ended up giving them secret nuclear design information accidentally. This is something in the public's interest to know. Jim Risen wrote about it in his book. Jim Risen now faces jail. Um, the district court said there was a reporter's privilege. The circuit court said there's not. This is um, occurring in one of the most, well, the most conservative court in the United States of America, in the Eastern District of Virginia, and there are huge implications. So while the Justice Department appeared to pull back after they were caught subpoenaing the 23 AP lines and doing a search warrant on Jim Rosen of Fox, they said, oh, we're going to redo the guidelines, which really meant reverting back to what the guidelines had always been. Um, what they failed to do was lift the subpoena on Jim Risen, who now faces jail um, if he chooses to protect his source. Um, so I think the implications are huge. I know in Tom's case, um, there were government motions to preclude mentions of whistleblowing and to preclude newspaper articles, and the judge was very firm in Tom's case about we're not going to go down that deep, dark hole, was the way he put it, of going after journalists or trying to implicate the journalists. Um, but at some point, and this became obvious in John Kiriakou's case, because one of the journalists named in the indictment ended up writing a big article um, about John and about their communication. It's come up in the warrantless wiretapping article by Eric Lishblau um, and Jim Risen because they thought Tom Drake was a source. So at one point they talked about whether they should do some sort of article saying Tom Drake was not a source because he was being prosecuted. I think there are huge implications, and, and I think journalists in the mainstream media have been far too reluctant to recognize that the war on whistleblowers is a war on their sources, that whistleblowers are kind of the last stop of democratic society, and that without whistleblowers, they don't get their biggest stories, some of the, the most important stories that the public needs to know. Um, and I think technology has only made this proposition more high stakes. I think all journalists should be using encryption when dealing with uh, you know, a high-risk source. Um, I, there are probably 10 in the entire country that I would go to with a whistleblower story that I actually trust to do it the right way um, and to protect their source, and I have a pretty high standard. I mean, are you willing to go to jail to protect your source? Because that's a level of people and clients I'm dealing with and representing. Um, so they're really difficult questions being posed. I, and I think in general, the war on whistleblowers and the war on journalists that we've seen some manifestations of, it's part of a broader war on information including hacktivists, including bloggers, inc you know, including alternative media. Um, this war on information that has been waged by the executive branch um, is extremely dangerous in a democracy um, and really needs to stop. I mean, it's implicating everything about the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of association, the freedom of the press, um, the right to petition Congress for redress of grievances, which is present in a lot of these cases. And I think um, 
the whistleblower, I mean, the, the, the anti-leak or the whistleblower, the reporter privilege laws that have been put out, for example, by Cardin, Benjamin Cardin of Maryland, again, have the same loophole exception that are in the whistleblower laws. And that's why people like Tom Drake and Ed Snowden and John Kiriakou are unprotected. There's a big, huge national security exemption. So you would have reporter privilege with your whistleblower from, uh, you know, I'm trying to think from, from a nursing home, perhaps, uh, a, a nurse blowing the whistle there. But in your dealing with any kind of national security or intelligence source, you would not have the reporter privilege if for, and, and, you know, some sort of protective legislation as written were to be enacted right now. It would really be limited. Um, and I think case law may, in, may instead come down and create, I mean, if the Supreme Court ends up granting certiorari in the case of Jim Risen, then there could be case law on this. And I predict that would probably say, you guys need to go to Congress and lobby and get legislation enacted to protect you. But again, the huge elephant in the room and the huge carve out that leaves whistleblowers and journalists unprotected is that national security pretty much trumps everything. And you can pretty much name any object in this room, and I don't have time to do it right now, this bottle of water, and I can tell you how this bottle of water is important to national security, or that microphone, or, I mean, it, it's, it, national security is so loose right now in the definition of what national security is, and the fear mongering by the government is so loud um, that it's very difficult these days for people who are trying to keep information free and trying to preserve free press to be able to argue that uh, now a lot of the stuff you're trying to hide is not because of national security, it's because you're trying to keep secret illegalities at the highest levels of the government that include high crimes and misdemeanors. And if what happened right now with Edward Snowden, which is very reminiscent of the COINTELPRO scandal, had occurred in a different political climate, people would be marching in the streets and presidents and high-level people would be resigning. But we're in a totally different political climate right now and one of the biggest things I have to fight against is apathy. And that's really hard to do. Thank you very much. Um, Thomas Drake, you've been, uh, you both have been whistleblowers and, and, and Tom Drake, you've been uh, you faced a decision. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about it to, to talk to the Baltimore Sun. Did you think about what the implications would be? Um, and can you talk a little bit about your experience and again what you see as the as the implications for for reporters, it's mostly journalists or journalists in training here in this room? I would just remind uh, all journalists and reporters or budding journalists reporters or those who are seeking a career in uh, journalism. You cannot report the news without sources, period. Except in the post 9-11 world, and particularly in the Obama administration, uh, any attempt to bring light in the public interest to what goes on inside government with respect to national security, I will say right here again, is considered a criminal, criminal conduct. So if you expose government wrongdoing, if you expose government illegality, you expose government violations of law, you expose direct threats to public safety or health, and it's national security related, or national defense related, or in some ways indirectly related, that's considered a criminal act. Um, I spent many years within the government through proper channels blowing the whistle. There's any number of channels, Inspector General, Office of General Counsel, supervisory chains, Congress, Department of Defense. Um, I spent many years. Um, severe retaliation or reprisal even within the system. I'll just give you a couple of highlights because it's important for the context of answering why I went to a reporter to understand what led up to the fateful decision I ultimately did make to go to the press with what I knew. You just don't go to the press lightly when you work at the National Security Agency. One of the other ways of 
expanding the acronym NSA is never say anything. <laughs> and if you say anything to those not authorized to receive it, you might just find yourself on the receiving end, as I did, um, of a criminal indictment, facing, as I did, many, many decades in prison. But let me, let's not, let me get ahead of myself. See, I was eyewitness, and this is where Daniel Ellsberg and I have had many long conversations, uh, both privately and publicly, because I was the first whistleblower since Ellsberg charged under the same act. In fact, the same paragraph, 793E. Ironically enough, there was actually the first modification to the Espionage Act of 1917, um, in, done in 1950, the National Security Act of 1950, extraordinary series of hearings under Senator Pat McCarran. He added that paragraph to deal with the so-called pumpkin papers. <laughs> Alger Hiss fame. I was reminded of that when I watched a dozen FBI agents surround my home and ultimately enter my home with, they had these poles in the backyard okay, looking for pumpkins, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Timing is everything in combat. So. <laughs> yes, pumpkins. Um, I blew the whistle on High crimes and misdemeanors. I mean, I, it's, I find myself here, particularly here at USC in the Annenberg Center, once again present to precisely what I confronted in the short <coughs> days and weeks after 9-11. And one of them was the government unchaining itself from the Constitution in total violation of the Fourth Amendment, in total violation of the then intact Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. I, also was eyewitness to major intelligence failures on the part of NSA. 9-11 was a systemic failure of the government to provide for the common defense. That's actually the two primary responsibilities of the government, as stated so eloquently in the preamble of the U.S. Constitution, and the cover-up that ensued, and then this multi-billion dollar fraud, waste, and abuse. So I went through every channel, particularly the secret surveillance. Uh, I was there. Um, when the foundational surveillance programs, the mass surveillance programs, uh, were put into place before anybody else knew it, including the secret court, um, Edward Snowden was now eyewitness to what metastasization of the surveillance programs uh, over the intervening years. And so I went to my boss, I went to the IG, I went to the Office of the Counsel. <laughs> my moment of truth was the first week in October when he simply said, you don't understand, Mr. Drake, when I confronted him with the stark reality that I face, I'm staring right into Pandora's box, that here is the government having unchained itself from the Constitution's secret, and under the 9-11 justification is going to engage in mass surveillance against the United States, turning our country into the equivalent of a foreign nation. And he said, you don't understand. It's all legal. The White House has approved the program. And he always referred to it as the program. And I knew that first week in December, not or October, not realizing the time that President Bush had just a couple of days earlier signed a secret directive authorizing NSA to engage in mass surveillance. Mass surveillance that has still, and I keep telling people this, not even the Edward Snow disclosure to date have revealed what I became aware of after 9-11. Okay? I've talked about this. I'm trusting that there will be more documentation coming forward that will prove the fuller extent of precisely what was unleashed after 9-11 and all the years since. So the hair, my, the hair on the back of my neck went straight up. As, as I spoke with Ani during my radio interview earlier on your radio network here at Annenberg, I was a very young teenager growing up in the 1970s. History was now the history of what I confronted was making the history of the 1970s look tame, my mild by comparison. And yet we can't forget our own history. President resigning, Pentagon Papers, Ellsberg, Watergate, all those extraordinary hearings from the Church and Pike Committee here. And Frank Church himself warned the nation about what would happen with advances in technology. Would, we might find ourselves in the abyss to paraphrase church that, from which we could not return. So I blew the whistle. I was a material witness on two 
congressional investigations. All of my material evidence cannot be located to this day. I've got people actually trying to attempt to track down the archives. People don't want those archives opened up. It's Pandora's box. In fact, none of my evidence, which was in the thousands and thousands of pages, uh, that was provided to both Saxby Shambliss, uh, Congressional Investigation 9-11, as well as a joint inquiry in 2002, uh, the only record that apparently exists is that I was interviewed. Okay. Apparently, the evidence was so secret that it couldn't be put into the secret report, even as a state secret within the secrecy system. And long story short, as I found myself, after having written a letter to now former NSA Director General Alexander in November 2005, and then losing my job as a result of that NSA and having to seek employment elsewhere in government, still technically tied to NSA, now at the National Tennis University, I'm reading this article in the New York Times written by Eric Lichtblau and James Rison, and as soon as I read it, I said, they're going to come after me. Very few people knew about the secret surveillance programs. This is now December 2005. This is four years and three months after I discovered the, hard, the, the stark reality, to my horror, of what the government was entering into. And so I spent about six weeks, because they, in two weeks later they launched this massive national security leak investigation. And then I spent six weeks, six weeks deciding, do I go to the press? Because that, that was the third rail. The third rail was to go to the press with what I knew. All other channels were now completely exhausted. And so I did. I made that fateful choice. And I contacted a reporter from the Baltimore Sun anonymously. And I knew in doing so that I could not only lose my job, but that they could not launch, obviously just launch a criminal uh, leak investigation, uh, that I could find myself on a very, very, very uh, short end of a stick and possibly facing prison. That I knew. So why did I do it? Well, I pause. Is the liberty and freedom of citizens worth it? Can we actually allow our government, because history is not kind here, um, abandon the rule of law? Do we permit a secret government to grow from, from within? Because essentially we had a silent coup in this country after 9-11. Um, I said no. And I was eyewitness in the fall of 2001 to the subversion of the very Constitution that I had taken an oath four times in my government career to support and defend. I would not violate that oath. An oath to an idea an idea of how to govern ourselves, a grand experiment launched over 225 years ago, and I just thought that the grand experiment needed to continue. And 9-11 was not an excuse to unchain ourselves and abandon the very essence and the heart of the American experience. Well, so I go to the reporter, and then I find myself under investigation for my own discovery as early as April of 2006. Then I'm visited unceremoniously by a dozen FBI agents in November of 2007. And then during the course of my FBI cooperation, I am threatened by the chief prosecutor in April 2008. How would you like to spend the rest of your life in prison, Mr. Drake? This should give you a sense of how serious the government was, how far they would go to protect one of the deepest secrets of the government, the surveillance programs. That was the heart of why they came after me, unless you cooperate with their investigation. <coughs> I broke it off, hired a private attorney, told the attorney I'd be willing to go to prison for what I did. Obama's elected president, everybody, including my private attorney, thought it would all go away. No. In April of 2010, I had been charged secretly three weeks earlier, I was indicted publicly. And the rest is now history because I sit here in front of you as a free human being. I was able to retain my rights, retain my freedoms, <coughs> retain my liberty. I can't even begin to tell you what that means, to actually keep the very things that I had taken an oath to support and defend. And so what we're seeing now in, in Ellsberg, who you're going to hear from more later, things that were illegal during the 1970s are now legal in this country. 
And although I was the second whistleblower since Ellsberg charged in like manner, and he knew that, as I had said, I've said publicly, I was exhibit number one for the government. What happens? How dare you, whistleblower? They were going to call me that until after I was able to hold them off. How dare you hold up a mirror to, to power? How dare you speak truth to or of power? And we're going to criminalize your disclosures. We're going to criminalize the information you had retained. And we're going to make life really, really bad for you. And we're going to send the most chilling of messages. So here's what's at risk. Because I can argue, and I say this from the long perspective of a history that's not kind, we, have, we can't forget why we actually had a violent American revolution against the British Crown. In fact, the judge in my case reminded the prosecution during my pro forma sentencing, where the chief prosecutor, William Welsh, attempted to continue my case in public and reminded, reminded the chief prosecutor that this didn't pass a smell test. We don't do this to an American. That's why we had an American Revolution. That it took you two and a half years to find a way to indict an American citizen? Unconscionable. You put Mr. Drake through four years of hell. I was broken, bankrupt, uh, blacklisted. So what's at stake is the very heart of the American experience. What's at stake is what does it mean to be a constitutional republic? What's at stake? is the ability of the press to report on authorities, the ability of the press to do aggressive journalism, including what's going on inside high places. That's the role of the press. And although clearly under Obama we have this unprecedented war against whistleblowers, what it's ultimately about, and I'm going to recast what, what Jocelyn said so eloquently, this is a direct assault. I'm going to say this in as strong a language as I can possibly say here. This is a direct assault on the foundational amendment of the Constitution, the First Amendment. It's the cornerstone. We lose the cornerstone with the asset of secrecy and surveillance and all manner of government wrongdoing and violations of law then we will remove, what will disappear is the very heart of who we are as Americans, a thing that even defines who we are in terms of our own history. And we lose the prospect of continuing the grand experiment for all of its flaws and all of its foibles because it's worth it. If the sovereignty of who we are is worth it, the sovereignty of citizenry, the ability to associate freely, the ability to speak freely, the ability to report on what the government is doing in your name. If that's not in the public interest, I don't know what isn't. You cannot have an alien form of government called the national security state coexisting with the Constitution of the United States in the form of a constitutional republic. Something has to give. We are the early warning systems. We are saying, hey, something's not right here. We're going astray. And that's what's at risk going forward. Thank you, Thomas Drake. Um, So there's about 15 minutes left. I have a couple of other questions, but I think I'd like to open it up. I'm going to just throw those questions out there. I don't want you to answer them right away, a couple of things. But I want to get to other questions. But in as we're talking, some of this might come up. Um, when is it appropriate uh, to hold back? When, what is that balance between freedom and security? Um, when is it uh, when it is right for a, a newspaper like the New York Times, who actually stood sat on that James Risen story for 13 months, uh, the editor uh, at the time uh, citing the fact that there was a traumatic time after 9/11. It was only three years after 9/11. Uh, 
Um, is that a factor? When, when, when should a, a newspaper hold back? When should uh, government agencies or people within the agencies not reveal? What, what, is the, what is the balance? So that's one thing in your responses maybe you could consider. And then I also want to talk about possible solutions. There is a shield law that's now advancing uh, from uh, Senator Schumer. A lot of people criticize it as being too narrow. The definition of journalist is too narrow. But those are some of the other things that we can talk about. But um, you can sort of see if you can fold that into some of your answers, because I do want to get time for questions. We have about 15 minutes left. So who has a question? Otherwise, I'll just keep asking. But I'm sure there must be questions. We got Yes, sir. Uh, what are some uh, resources or ways that we can protect ourselves uh, or, uh, from said surveillance? And, uh, how, do, how do we like, protect ourselves electronically against government spying? The question well, is, how do we protect ourselves electronically against government spying? Oh, I'm going to turn that particular one over to Tom in a minute, but when is it appropriate to hold back a story? Let's just look at the, the stories that have come out as a result of Edward Snowden. While the government claims there's been all this damage, or there may be damage in the future, every single story based on the Snowden documents has been run by the government. And Bart Gelman, one of the main people reporting, said that they have always agreed to hold back whatever the government wanted, that there's not been serious disagreement about that. So the government's being very disingenuous when it's talking about all this information coming out that's harmful. Um, in terms of the reporter shield law, the problem is the same thing as with the Whistleblower Protection Act. There's a big carve out that exempts national security and intelligence employees from protection. And again, national security is, has a very broad definition um, that the government is constantly trying to broaden. Um, and then in terms of protecting yourselves from surveillance, I'll turn that over to Tom. At a minimum, something like PGP, pretty good privacy, can be used obviously with, um, I'm not going to talk about what mechanisms I use with um, Snowden, but I am encrypted to the hilt. Um, Tom can name a bunch of other, get in, do you give a quick little tutorial on trying to avoid surveillance? Yeah, to be prudent, you have to assume that surveillance is in place. Um, I certainly am very well aware of what NSA's capabilities and capacities are, and many of the disclosures that have come out since June talk about those directly. So, no different than would you leave, the, would you leave your house unlocked? No, right? Why? Because there's a possibility of you know someone coming along? Yes. So you have to be prudent. Is it a guarantee and is it an absolute protection? No. So one of the, one of the mechanisms, if you're using email, um, and there are various ways of this, but pretty good privacy is pretty good. Uh, the risk, of course, is you have to make sure it's, it's actually installed correctly because there's other, there's other vulnerabilities. It's not the, the math. Um, I used to have a pretty strong math background. Um, the math is awfully good when it comes to PGP, especially at 2048 and above in terms of the bit length. The problem, the uh, key length, the problem is if, um, is the infrastructure involved. So use PGP where possible, right, for email. Now, if you've got things that are more sensitive than that, then you've got to put yourself in sort of more of an anonymized environment that's also protected through encryption, OTR is another one way to do that. And there's various implementations of, of OTR, both on PCs and on mobile devices as, as well as uh, Macs. Um, there are other environments uh, in which you can tour, does have other hidden services that allow you to use, including there's protocols like ZRTP, if you need encrypted uh, video, right, slash voice equivalent, depending on the flavor. Um, you got to be prudent. I mean, I'm just, I mean, in a nutshell, I, there's a lot more I could say, but I, I obviously want to get to, to more questions. You just have to assume the surveillance is in place. But I will tell you this, one, one, one it's the cautionary note, if the state decides to target you like they did me, they have an extraordinary number of, of arrows in their quiver. There's not much you can do. And then, of course, if they couldn't bust into my system, which I had no indications they were able to, they just come to your house and take it with a warrant. 
Richard, do you want to add to, yeah. to that? Okay. Oh, Mary. I have a question. Cindy, in the beginning you asked, you know, this basic question of traitor or patriot. Right. And I'd, I'd like to open this up to the panel, because Ellsberg went to the New York Times, she went to the Baltimore Sun, and uh, yet Snowden flew out of the country and went to China and then went to reporters that were not from American newspapers. Right. So I'm, I'm just curious about your views. Does that make a difference in terms of trade or patriot? Well, just to, for a little bit of context there, Edward Snowden um, specifically stated that because of the New York Times sat on that story, James Risen story, for 13 months, that's the reason he did not go to the New York Times. That's the reason he went to uh, to Glenn Greenwald, uh, who, who was then or soon after uh, joined The Guardian, uh, Laura Poitras, the documentary filmmaker, and Barton Gel Gelman of The Washington Post. Had The Times not sat on the Risen story, the indications are that Risen, rather that Snowden, would have gone. There are thousands of other newspapers. Right, but I mean, he also went to The Washington Post, so it's yeah. not that he didn't go. Yeah. But anyway, that's, I mean, that's a partial answer. That I, let's see what my colleagues that. say about that. Is, do, do you feel that there is a I'm, I'm, I just want to know your views. I don't feel there's a difference, mm -hmm. no. Neither do I. I felt given <laughs> that what happened uh, and the cases he had studied of William Binney and Tom Drake, who went through every conceivable internal channel and got, it, it were faced with 35 years in jail and or the rest of his life, um, and Bradley Manning getting tortured, Bradley now Chelsea Manning, um, I, I think, and Tom and a whole bunch of my other NSA whistleblowers immediately after the Snowden disclosures came out said he really did blow the whistle in the only way he could. And it's sad that that, that means having to go to another country in order to feel safe blowing the whistle. And documents were given to only American journalists. And um, the Guardian is a mainstream news outlet for which Glenn was writing, Bart for the Washington Post, Laura um, at that point was doing document, had done documentaries for um, the New York Times. Um, and he gave this, he didn't throw it out there willy-nilly, he gave it to journalists in their editorial discretion to decide what was newsworthy and what was in the public interest. So the binary patriot or traitor has always been problematic. It's not that simple, and it's, it's every single debate I do is uh, patriot or traitor or uh, hero or traitor, and it's these labels are really not helpful. Just to, yeah, well, and we we deliberately chose that after a vigorous discussion because we wanted to get people to pay attention to the poster. And I will acknowledge it. Just to add to that, I mean, this is what Edward Snowden said to the New York Times. Uh, last fall. So long as there's broad support amongst the people, it can be argued that there's a level of legitimacy even to the most invasive and morally wrong program, as it was informed and will an informed and willing decision. However, programs that are implemented in secret, out of public o o oversight, that lack legitimacy, that's a problem. It also represents a dangerous normalization of governing in the dark, where discussions with enormous public impact occur without any public impact. It sounds like the kind of thing we would teach in a journalism school, and it's Edward Snowden. I mean, so he, it wasn't as though, as you said, he didn't just go willy-nilly. Mark. I have a question for uh, Justin, because uh, in your role with GAP, So if you look at the cascading revelations from, you know, that go back a, a decade and go through what Tom did and then through uh, Horizon and then uh, Snowden and now we have the CIA report uh, that's hung up in the intelligence committee. Um, I'm just interested in your sense of where you think journalism or journalists in general are in this. Now somebody started that uh, rather uh, acerbic uh, Tumblr site, Journalists Against Journalism, uh, you know, to aggregate all of the denunciations of, of uh, Greenwald, uh, primarily. Uh, is there, do you think there's sufficient awareness among, uh, you know, American journalists that, that this threat is hanging over their heads, or is this something that they're accommodating to? I don't think until the 23 AP subpoenas 
and the search warrant on Jim Rosen of Fox that um, most journalists were aware. And most journalists are still sort of like, oh, Jim Rosen, Jim Rosen over there, subpoenaed three times, but not really thinking. Did, one of our most prominent journalists in this country, who's won a Pulitzer Prize, may go to jail to protect a source. Um, I think journalists have been the saving grace for a number of whistleblowers throughout throughout the history of the press, um, including Ellsberg, including you, including me. I mean, Jane Mayer has done incredible work that has helped. Cy Hirsch has a whole host of journalists have been incredibly important in bringing whistleblower stories forth. But I feel like journalists, a lot of journalists, have not been willing to look seriously. Charlie Savage, for instance, doesn't believe that there is a actual campaign, deliberate campaign, against leakers, though everybody else on the planet seems to, to get that. Um, and the, I have documents from the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press saying that, that they were told that in an Aspen Institute gathering of the elite in the rarefied atmosphere of, of Colorado. Um, I think journalists, it's easy to kind of look the other way or be like, but we're journalists. And whistleblowers, I mean, even when you said, yeah, they're strange, they're kind of crazy, even that, you know what, how about brave? How about risk their life? Give up their life in Edward Snowden's case and Chelsea Manning's. Give up their life to get information out there to try to make our democracy. I mean, I know the stereotype. Obviously, leakers are smeared as vengeful, out for fame, out for profit, or crazy. That's the stereotype. Um, but journalists, I hope, are becoming more aware that, um, you know, just because Glenn Greenwald wrote for Salon, you know, you can't derisively say, oh, well, this person's a blogger, they're not, they're not a real journalist. Pe with me, I freelance for the mainstream press, I publish in the mainstream press, and I blog fairly regularly. So I don't know which camp you want to put me in, but I know during the trial of Chelsea Manning, the judge said, if Chelsea Manning had given this information to the New York Times instead of WikiLeaks, would you still be prosecuting him? And you could hear a pin drop, and you could tell the government didn't know how to answer that, and they said yes. And so that sends a very strong message that even if you're only a blogger or alternative media, independent media, you are just as at risk. And going after whistleblowers is a backdoor way to go after you. Journalists are named in every single one of these indictments. Um, and we are, I mean, uh, Jim Risen is the example of that. That is a whistleblower case and being brought under the Espionage Act. And Risen faces jail for that. The government wants the equivalent of an official secrets act in this country, which the United Kingdom has. Just look at the Guardian history and the extraordinary, the D notices that were given to them as a result of, of their being a primary outlet uh, for the disclosures that started happening in June of 2013 from, from uh, Edward Snowden. Uh, this is just this is what we're facing right now. And, and El Ellsberg has been extremely eloquent. I mean, in many respects, his own history has been resurrected uh, in terms of been updated for the 21st century. He says it's far worse now than it ever was during his time period. And remember, let's not forget, he was declared the most dangerous man in America over 40 years ago. I was declared an enemy of the state. The, the government char in public said that what, what I did was worse than being a spy. I would have the blood of American soldiers on my hands. I endangered the lives of soldiers overseas. And it'd be worse than a spy because at least spies give their secrets up in secret. But you have your disclosure get published all over the press, so everybody gets to see it, including the spies. And in Snowden's case, we have high-level officials saying that my client should be hung from a by his neck from a tree. Now, I don't know why any j journalist would, or the head of the Intel Committee would suggest bringing back lynching. I think that was a pretty dark period in American history, personally. But making death threats against an American by very, four very senior people in the government, um, including the former NSA director, the former CIA director, um, and the head of the Intel Committee, and you know, talking about tr trying him for treason, which is not possible under law, actually. But, I mean, these are pretty high stakes uh, we're gonna go. Sorry. Uh, we're going to go a little past one. There's a question here, and then Bob, and then right over here. Okay. Um, actually, there are a couple questions. First, if you can make um, them kind of uh, quick, because we're, we're running a little bit late. Okay. Well, um, European Court Justice 
so return the legislation allowing for instrument data collection? That is a good move, but unfortunately the biggest partner in the spying scandal is Britain's um, GCHQ. So in terms of enforcing that, I don't know what the enforcement mechanism would be. In terms of Snowden being in Russia, he is there for one reason, and that is because while he was flying to Latin America, the U.S. revoked his passport while he was going through Russia. He, is in the, he was in the transit zone. We, the U.S., are the reason he is in Russia. So all of this propaganda that comes out about him fleeing to Russia um, is completely, that's just what it is. It's, it's agit prop. I mean, it's pure propaganda. Wow. Yeah, by the way, we should recall it was George Washington in his farewell address who warned about the impostures of pretended patriotism. Mm -hmm. He said this was the great menace uh, and he had some military experience. I do want to say we don't have to feel so rushed. We have three hours tonight in the auditorium. Ellsberg will be joining us and then you have Ellsberg will be speaking tomorrow at another program. So people will have ample opportunity. I just want to throw one little point in here. There's a certain self-righteousness among media people about this leak, but not that leak. And I suspect many people in this room who have worked here know that they live off leaks all the time. Uh, and those leaks quite often involve national security in a much more direct way than these cases. Uh, I remember Edward Tellum once telling me about the cottage test in Livermore and the great success they had with the X-ray laser, which was probably the most important secret. Turned out to be false. Uh, they didn't have the success. But, but I think there's a certain amount of hypocrisy. And just as an example, Ryzen, when he exposed Wen Ho Lee, a scientist at Los Alamos, as having done terrible things, there was no idea of prosecuting uh, in that case. That was a secret the government wanted out. Now, when Ryzen is involved in showing things that they don't want out, he's suddenly the enemy. So the real issue here is the selective use of leaking. The greatest leaker in this country is the U.S. government, period. <laughs> and it's an oxymoron to call it an authorized leak. But if the President of the United States or senior officials are leaking, they're leaking in their own interest. We actually heard that. This, they, they'll acknowledge this. Well, I'll give you an example. So you, I think you brought it up. Um, the other day, the Washington Post published an article about how we were collecting content on a certain small number of countries. We were collecting everything. But... The, the government asked the Washington Post not to name the country, and the Washington Post held off. Two or three days later, Chris Inglis of the NSA said it was Iraq. So that, though, is an authorized leak, which to me is an oxymoron, but it's a leak which will not be prosecuted. If one of my clients or would-be clients or someone you know, had said it was Iraq, they would be prosecuted for espionage. There's a huge hypocrisy governing leaks. Leon Panetta, the director of the CIA, leaked leaked the names of undercover CIA agents to make the film, for to make a Hollywood film, Zero Dark Thirty. And meanwhile, my client, John Kiriakou, is sitting in jail for confirming the name of a torturer. So this, this gives me a moment to just a one for the public record yet again say the following. There's only two people since 9-11 who have been investigated, prosecuted, indicted, and convicted for torture and surveillance. Those who disclosed it as whistleblowers. Namely, John Kiriakou, currently serving 30 months in a federal penitentiary in Loretto, Pennsylvania, and myself. And neither one of us had anything to do with actual torture or the surveillance. We and simply held up the mirror. If John had tortured someone, he wouldn't be in jail. And if I had actually engaged in mass <laughs> surveillance, it's true. I myself would have immunity because I, and I have to, this is going back to the Nuremberg principles, would have been just following orders. And obviously that's a defense. We're going to take one more question. It's right here. And uh, then we can talk informally afterwards. Please go ahead. So you mentioned apathy as being one of the greatest issues. I mean, you can barely get one in five people of my age to vote. So how do we address this challenge? <laughs> Um, it, it depends on, on the community. I mean, I do feel like there's an activism among a younger generation more on the tech side in terms of the hacker community, activists. Um, but in terms of getting, awakening people, I don't know. It's hard for 
kids, who were my teenagers, who have, they don't even, they were born, they don't remember September 10th world. They never knew that. And they've grown up on the internet. They don't know a world without internet. But I think trying to tap into that, I mean, everybody should play to their strength. You guys are writers cover stories like this, write stories about this, investigate stories like this. If you're an artist, illustrate stuff about this. If you're a lawyer, defend people from this kind of government overreach. Um, and in, in terms of getting people involved, I mean, I always say, if you want to start, follow Thomas Drake on Twitter, at Thomas underline Drake, <laughs> Thomas Drake one, yeah. underscore one, at follow me, at Jessalyn Radak. We are constantly putting out things you can do, like, hey, today they're talking about, like, why they shouldn't have to reveal the latest drone memo. Um, call this person today. That's all you got to do, pick up the phone and call someone. You guys are old enough to vote. I live in D.C. I don't have a voting representative, but all of you, most of you, do. Um, and they do keep track when they get those calls. They do keep track. They need to hear from you more. The final but, question that I will simply ask is what future do you want to keep? It is your future. And in the preamble of the Constitution, says we the people in order to form a more perfect union. If you choose to take action to form a more perfect union, that your rights as a sovereign individual partnered with the collective of us, the we the people, matter, then you'll engage. If you choose not to engage, you deserve, we deserve the government we end up with. So I think on that note, I want to thank our fellow panelists.